the book of the Psalms, chapter number one. The book of the Psalms, chapter 30, 31. I'm sorry, so, chapter one. Chapter one, Psalms chapter one is where we will be. I don't know how often you bask in the sunlight of the Psalms, but I hope it's often. God has given us the Psalms to teach us much about who he is. It is the longest chapter of the uh, book of the Bible, and um, I would like for us to look at how it is that God wanted to start off this wonderful book of the Bible some, with this first chapter, Psalm chapter number one. I'll read all the way down through verse number six, although we'll, we will spend most of our time in the first three verses, mentioning quickly at the end, verse four and following, but we will spend most of our time in the first three verses. But let's read the whole Psalm, follow along as I, as I read. Blessed is the man who walks, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But, really in contrast, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. This man... This woman, this person, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields his fruit in his season. And its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Really here before verse 4, there's a transition. You could almost supplant the word, however. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Can we pray and ask God to help us as we come to his word today? Father, we come to you. Lord, we're so thankful for your word. Lord, thankful for this opportunity to gather together with your people. Uh, Lord, we are your people. We are, uh, the Bible uh, tells us that we're the sheep of your pasture. Uh, Lord, we come to you for the food we need for our souls. Lord, you are the one who restores us. You are the one who leads us beside the still waters. Lord, you are the one who comforts us and helps us. And so, God, we come to you today. Would you please meet with us? Would you work in our hearts? Use your word to feed us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. How is it that God starts off this wonderful book of the Bible, the book of the Psalms? I would like for us to look at this. He starts off... And he makes the statement, blessed is the man. What does it mean to be blessed? What does it mean to be blessed? We've thrown lots of common day synonyms at this word. Uh, it means to be, some would say it means to be happy. Happy is the man or the woman who does what we find in this text of scripture. I think that's okay. I do think that the world has an understanding of the word um, happy that's different than what this word blessed means. But I do want us to look and, and think about what does it mean to be blessed? It really means, um, you know, spiritually speaking, it really means to be, to be fulfilled or to be, how about this word, to be satisfied. Is it wrong for God's people to want to be satisfied? You know, I think we live in a day in which a lot of people say, well, that we'll be satisfied someday. That's when we get to heaven. In the meantime, we just have to grin, grunt, and bear it. We just got to make it through. We just got to bear down and get through this life. Someday we'll smile. Someday we can have joy. You know, when we get to heaven, 
No, folks, I think that we are people who, like I quoted just a few moments ago from some of Psalm chapter 23, God wants his people to, to know his goodness, to have their souls nourished. God wants his people to be satisfied. And I want us to look at this today because there is a satisfaction that the, that the world is looking for that the world is seeking after that is different than what we have here in this text of Scripture. But I want you to know that down deep within the soul of every single human, there is a desire to have in your life what is wrapped up in the first word of the book of Psalms, to be blessed, to be fulfilled, to really be nourished, and to be satisfied. Now, we live in a day in which we don't believe everything that we've told. Are you somewhat skeptical? Do you find yourself sort of skeptical? You know? If I hear it and it sounds too good to be true, guess what? It's probably because it's too good to be true, right? Um, we just don't believe everything. I mean, do, do, can, can you really believe every commercial you see? Can you really believe every infomercial you see? You know, can we really believe everything we read on a, in a news article or everything we see on the evening news. I mean, we just, we, and, and it's a sad thing, but it is what it is. We have come to the place where we are, I guess you could say, a little bit, we're, we're skeptical. Um, I mean, you even take a reputable part of our United States. You even take our U.S. Postal Service. Very reputable. But our U.S. Postal Service will put things in my mailbox that guarantee that I'm soon to be a millionaire. And what do we do with it? Oh, we just chunk it. It's junk mail. Folks, can I tell you something? I want us to look at Psalm chapter, uh, the Psalm chapter number 1 today. And I just want you to know that what God tells us in this chapter, folks, he tells us how we can be blessed, satisfied. And I want you to know you can take it to the bank because God didn't give us junk mail. What he has given us in his word is truth. Now, verse number one, if I can kind of wrap up verse number one, we'll look at it quickly, but verse number one, it basically tells us that this man who's going to be blessed, this woman who's going to be nourished, who's going to be fulfilled and satisfied in this life, that this, this man, this woman, this person, first of all, in chapter number one, actually knows where they're not going to find it. In order to know where you are going to find this, this blessedness or this satisfaction that comes from God, first of all, this person knows where it's not out. And if I can just wrap it up and then we'll look at it, it's really saying this. Verse number one, you ready for the book of Psalms? Verse number one, the person who is truly blessed knows good and well that you are not going to find it listening to the lies of this world. This world Though it comes to us 150 miles an hour telling us you need this, you need this, this is the way, this is what's going to make you happy. This, is, this world does not know how to have their soul satisfied. They come up empty every time. And the person who's truly going to be blessed knows how to see through their lies. Let's look at verse number one. Blessed is the man, the woman. Okay, you see the word man. Don't get caught up on that. This is, this is man, woman, person, anybody. Blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffer. So the blessed person, first of all, when it says they don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. The word wicked there is a word a lot of times we find it translated the ungodly. It's a word that... I, I personally think the word wicked is a little bit harsh for this Hebrew word, but it's talking about a person who's living life without God, and I do think that that person can be characterized as wicked. But I think, I think on the other side, you have a person, wicked just sounds like somebody who's out doing debauched, I mean just horrible, sinful, wicked things. Um, a, 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 a person described by this word really is just a person who maybe they're a good old Joe, maybe they're pretty nice, maybe it's a good neighbor, maybe it's a, a good person, but they just are living life without God. They don't want it. They think they don't need them. Maybe there's a God, maybe there's not. I don't care, I don't need them. That's the way they live. That's actually what this word is. Okay, so the person who's going to be blessed doesn't live his life listening to the counsel of this ungodly world. Okay, 
The, the, the word list, um, walking in the council. You see the word council? It's a word that means input. Um, it's uh, the input of life. Where do you get your counsel for life? Counsel's coming in all the time. Um, the input, you know, uh, uh, a, a new computer not too long ago, I was taking all the stuff back in the summer earlier, I was taking all this stuff off of this old computer, I gave it to one of my kids, and I got a, a newer computer, and I was taking off all this old stuff, and I was putting it onto this new computer, all this stuff, and it was amazing how much stuff I had inputted into this, all this input, I mean, all day long, I had this computer for about for about six years, and I'm taking everything off of this old computer, putting it into this new computer. Um, did you know that your brain is a computer? God made it. It's pretty complicated. Hopefully, it lasts longer than six years, right? You know what your brain does all day, every day? I mean, all day, every day, your, your brain is taking in information, inputs coming in. Everything you watch, everything you read, everything you listen to, every conversation you have, all day long, input is coming into your computer. And all day long, all day long, your brain is, it's, it's deciphering, it's categorizing, it's um, deleting a, whole, a few things, hopefully, along the way, right? All day long, your brain is taking in, are you ready for the word in Psalm chapter 1? Counsel. All day long. Where do you get your counsel for life? The person who's truly going to have their soul satisfied doesn't get their counsel from the world who lives as though God doesn't exist. The person who's going to really be blessed and know the satisfaction that God has for his people are, are actually, this is going to be a man or a woman who, who can see through the lies. I mean, this world is so loud. It's coming to us so fast and so hard. A few years ago, a few years ago, I was, um, I, I love sports. I enjoy watching sports. Um, uh, and I, I, was, I was watching some football uh, with my father-in-law. My father-in-law is a big sports fan. And uh, it, was, it was New Year's Eve and then New Year's Day. And if you know anything that's going on in the sports world on those two days, it is tons of football, way too much football. Ladies, please go ahead and roll your eyes. Um, I mean, it was way too much football. All right, so me and my father-in-law, we're watching. And in two days' time, we watched six football games. Six football games. Now, we're not, like, glued to the TV. We're having fun with family. We're eating food. We're chilling. We're taking it easy. But, in, but like, sometimes we're glued to the TV, and we're very much pay paying attention. After two days and six football games, I looked at my wife. I said, baby, I think I need to detox. Now, folks, I mean, in the broad spectrum of, of entertainment that you find on the television, football is actually decently fine, right? But did you know that weird things are happening to me in just... And just two days and six football games, weird things. Like all of a sudden, guess what? I don't like my truck anymore. I like that truck. You know, the one on the, com on, on the commercial. Folks, I mean, I'm just talking the commercials. They just come at you so fast and so hard. Do you know what the goal of advertising is? And I'm not against advertising. It's a part of our world. It's just what it is. But I did a research. I was asked to speak at this teen. This, I was speaking at a, te at a teen conference. And uh, one of the, the they, had the, they had the main sessions. I was the, I was the, the speaker for the, the, the main sessions. But then they had these breakout sessions. And I was asked to do one of the breakout sessions that the kids could elect. And I was asked to do a session on teenagers and advertising. I thought, ooh, man, this, this, what, a, what, a great, what a great session for teens. Boy, teens really need this. Well, you know who need I needed this. I, I'm doing this research on advertising, and folks, I mean, there, there could be people who are in the advertising world that's totally fine, but I'm just telling you, okay, I'm reading from advertising people and firms and all this stuff, and they have a goal. They have a goal straight up. They make no bones about it. They want you to buy what they have, and so they want you to not want what you have. I think that's called discontentment. They, they, they work off of they want me and you to break the 10th commandment, to covet. And folks, we do it. And we hear it and we see it. I'll never forget when I got my first iPhone. Ooh, I remember. So we're talking back. Uh, man, so I have Verizon. Verizon didn't have the iPhone first. Uh, Sprint did, and I think somebody else got it. Then finally Verizon got it. I'm talking back in like 2000. Man, I don't know. That had been like 2000 eight or nine or ten something like that anyway 
I remember I, I, get, I get an email that Verizon was going to get the iPhone. And man, I, 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 I got this email that said if I pre-ordered, I could get it in the mail four days before they were even in the Verizon stores. I could get it, and I get this thing. I had a coupon. I was turning in my old one. I had a deal. And so I get this iPhone. Folks, I mean, I'm like, oh, you know. I get this thing. I didn't know how to work it. I'd never had one to do the, the, you know, you have the touch screen and the swiping. And every time I swiped it, I felt like I needed to wipe it off. You know, it's like, oh, man, what? this is taking forever. And so I, I'm, I'm messing with this thing. I had some questions about it. I take it to this Verizon store. You know, up until then, I had a BlackBerry with all the little push buttons and everything. And I took it in there. And, like, they weren't in the store yet. So all the Verizon cust- um, workers, they all left their customers. And they all gathered around me in a huddle. And we all did it together. <sighs> you know? And, uh... I had it for about a week. Guess what? I dropped it and broke it. <laughs> uh, it was just about, I don't know, it had to have been maybe, maybe three months later. My wife was having a problem with her flip phone, and so I had to go to the store, and I would, went to the Verizon store, and I could walk in, and he says, hey, man, you seen the new one? I said, oh, yeah, I got it right here. He said, no, 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 the new one. I said, no, I got it right here. He said, no, 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 there's a new one. I said, don't you tell me there's a new one. I just got this one. Folks, I mean, come on, can we, can we really keep up with how fast it's all going? But listen, they're going to tell you that, 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 that we, we need to because the next one's better, got a better camera. The next one's better, it's got a better this. It's got a better this. And I'm just talking cell phones. I'm just talking stuff. Folks, it goes on and on and on and on. And the problem isn't the devices. It's not the stuff. It's not the possessions. The problem is they're going after our heart because they're saying, no, 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 this is what's going to satisfy. No, 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 this is what's going to make you happy. No, 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 this is what you need. Folks, this world with Satan at the helm of all that's going on in, he is called the prince of the power of the air and folks it is coming at us so fast and so hard but the man who truly knows the blessing of God can see through it there's nothing wrong with having some of the things that we enjoy in this life have at it but they will never satisfy your soul they will break thieves will break through and steal they will rust and corrupt we all know it true satisfaction is not found in a new vehicle and the person who's truly going to have their soul blessed who's truly going to be satisfied verse number one is saying this man he doesn't walk through life listening to the counsel of all this world around him there's a progressive nature in the way the world works that we see in verse number one. Neither does it say, he, nor does he stand in the way of sinners, nor does he sit in the seat of scoffers. Now listen to the, to the, the way this, this verse rolls. It, it first shows a man who's walking, but he's listening. Then before long, he's standing, conversing. Before long, he's seated and bought in. That's the way the world works. I mean, think about, think about Lot. Remember Abraham's, um, Abraham's nephew? He's, he, 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 and Abra, he and Abraham, they traveled together with all of their herds, with all of their flocks, with all of their people. And then they were having struggles, so they decided to go different ways. And Abraham kindly said, Lot, you go wherever you want to go. You choose. I'll go the other way. The Bible says that Lot looked down towards the plains. They were well watered, a great place to, 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 to feed his sheep. Lot had no intention of actually going into Sodom and Gomorrah, the horrible cities that they were. But the Bible says that he pinched his he, he pitched his tents towards Sodom. And folks, that is where the struggle was. The next chapter we find we find Lot and he's actually moved his family into the city. And then a few chapters later, we find that he is actually, the phrase is, he was seated at the gate in the city. That was, that was the, the terminology that was used for those who were the elected officials of the city. Folks, Lot, you know what his problem was? He looked at this world as no danger to him. He listened. He walked in their council. Before long, he was seated with them. It's the way the world works, just a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. It's the way it works in my heart. And the person who's truly going to have their souls satisfied, 
the person who is truly going to have their soul satisfied, verse number one, says that they can see through the lies of this world. But then let's look at verse two. Verse two says, but in contrast, really, it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. What does it mean, his delight is in the law of the Lord? Um, what is it talking about when it says the law of the Lord? I mean, the most easy to understand explanation of what we mean by the law of the Lord is really just talking about the word of God. Okay, so you say, maybe you, maybe you say, Aaron, you mean to tell me you've been talking all this time say, telling us not to listen to, not to listen to the TV, which I'm not against having a TV. I have two TVs. Um, I, I, th- th- but, but instead to, to listen to the law of the Lord, to read your Bible. Uh, well, first of all, hopefully it's just not just me saying this. Hopefully we're seeing what God has to say. But folks, listen, he doesn't say to, not, he doesn't say to go read your Bible. It's, a, it's, it's much more of a descriptive word. It's an attitude word. He says that he delights in the law of the Lord. Now, folks, we get this word. What do you delight in? I mean, we understand this word because we all know what it means to delight. Now, just, uh, I mean, we delight in all types of things. It's what you get excited about. It's what you get emotionally pumped up about. We delight in many things in our, in our, in our lives. Um, we delight in our sports teams. We delight in our hobbies. We delight, I mean, lots of things. We delight in, we delight in simple things. We delight in food. You know, I was, just, I was listening to Pastor, you ladies, on Tuesday night. A whole night of chocolate and coffee, you know. I wonder if there's any ladies who delight in some chocolate. I was, uh, I got this idea. I, I threw it out to to him because uh, we were at a church that did a chocolate cafe. They they called it, and uh, there was like, man, uh, they 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 had they had every kind of chocolate you could imagine, every kind of coffee you could imagine, and then they uh, there was like 250 ladies that showed up at this event, and my wife was speaking. I was there for one reason and one reason only. It was just me and my wife. This was before we had a team, and we were there, and I was going to come up at one point and play my guitar while my wife sang, and then and then she was going to share, and I was going to leave, but because I had to be there, I was there. I was seated out in the parking lot. Listen to this. I was seated in the parking lot just beholding the scene of these ladies coming into this building um, with, the, with the smell of chocolate in the air. And I'm telling you, I'm sitting on my tailgate in the parking lot, and I'm watching these ladies, and their feet were not quite on the ground as they were floating towards the chocolate, you know? We delight in some simple things in this life. You know, I wonder if there's some men in here who delight in a big piece of red meat cooking on the grill. Arr! I mean, we, we, we delight in things, and there's nothing wrong with it. I wonder if there's anybody in here who delights in some, you know, in some, uh, some grandbabies that you get to see. You know, matter of fact, just this morning I saw, I saw somebody showing a picture of a brand new grandbaby to some people. Um, you know, my, uh, my daughter Ella, who was up here playing the violin a few moments ago uh, and singing, um, she was the first grandbaby on both sides of the family. Um, my, me, and, me and Steph, we were both the first on our, on our two sides of the family who, who had a grandbaby. So, um, so Ella was the first grandbaby. Man, it became a problem really fast. You know, we just have time off, and all of a sudden, my, my mother and my mother-in-law, they're like, you know, on Christmas. Ella was born in September. Matter of fact, her birthday was yesterday. And so um, she was born in September, so that Christmas she was three months old. And um, so we come in, man, during our time off, I mean, I mean like, our, our, my, our, my mother and my mother-in-law, they're like splitting the time down to the, to the hour to make sure there's proper da- baby distribution between the two of them, you know? I mean, it got crazy. Um, I, I remember getting a pair of pants for, uh, for Christmas, and they didn't fit me. And so my dad went with me to this apartment store where I'm trying on some different pairs of pants, and and uh, at one point I come out, I had a pair that I thought I liked. I'm, I, Dad was standing right outside, so I thought I walked out. Hey, Dad, what do you think about these? And my dad is like nowhere to be found. I mean, nowhere. I can't find him. I'm looking everywhere. Finally, guess where I find my dad? He's in the baby department. He's never been to the baby department a day in his life. He's found this little sales rack. You know, every few minutes he's come around the corner with these little sweaters. Isn't this just precious? I'm like, Dad, what's going on? You know what's going on? We all get it, right? He delights in this little girl. Hey, I got a question for you. What do you delight in? Can I tell you what David delighted in? Of all of the chapters of the Psalms, the one that he gave the, lo- the most attention to, at least the longest, is Psalm 119. Guess what the t- 
topic of the entire psalm was. The topic is the Word of God. And David tells us what his attitude is towards this book. Can I just give you a sampling? And my friend, I want you to know I'm scratching the surface of what David talks about when it comes to his attitude towards the Word of God. Listen to what he says in verse 16. I will delight myself in thy word and thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Thy testimonies are that your word also are my delight and my counselor. Verse 47, I will delight myself in your commandments which I have loved. Verse 70, their heart, talking about the world, is as fat as grease, but I delight in your word. Verse 77, let your tender mercies come to me that I may live for your word is my delight. Verse 174, I have longed for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. My friend, he says it over and over and over and over and over again. You want to know why David was a man after God's own heart? It's because he delighted in God's word. It's what he got excited about. Folks, what do you delight in? It says here that the man, who, the woman who's truly going to be satisfied is a person who doesn't listen to the lies of this world. Instead, it says that he delights in the word of God and he meditates on it day and night. The word meditate, it's talking about that you believe with all your heart that this book will satisfy your soul so you dig in. Have you ever have you ever just been spending time in the Word and it was so delicious to you that you wish you had more time but you just have to go? And you know, my friend, maybe, maybe you're here today and you would say, I don't know that I've ever had a season in my life where the Word was delicious to me. But my friend, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I believe you should pray that God would do that to you. That this word would not just be some necessary thing you gotta, you got to have in your life because you're a Christian, but this is delicious to you. In verse number, well, let me, let me just say this because I think this would be appropriate for me to just bring up quickly right here. Um, is, is there a difference, okay? I keep using this word delight because that's the word that we find here. Is there a, is there a difference between the word, b between the idea of delighting in something and then there being a sense of duty when it comes to the word of God? You know, a sense of duty. It's noble. It's good. You know, we, we honor those who really, with this sense of, of duty, it drives them to go and to to. to to, to be in the military and to fight and to, um, to protect our country and this sense of this noble cause of this sense of, of duty that drives you and it's noble, it's good, it's right I have my brother-in-law, he was 13 years a chopper pilot in the army now he's in the National Guard and he's been 20 years now in the National Guard and I mean uh, when he was in active duty some of the things that he did and some of the, 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 the he, he was over in uh, um, he, he's been in Iraq when we were there and he was in Afghanistan and it's just incredible the things that he's been involved in and he's been shot at and he's won all kinds of but but it was all duty you know what delight was delight was would have been to be back home with my sister and his family but a sense of of duty drove him and folks it's good and it's noble but I just want you to notice look at verse number two it does not say but his sense of duty is in the law of the Lord Folks, there is something, okay? There is something that needs to switch in our spiritual maturity where we stop just coming to this in a sense of duty. He says that there is a delight, and I'm not saying that a sense of duty is good and noble. Maybe you say, Aaron, you mean to tell me that you just explode out of your bed every morning? No, can I tell you two things I really delight in early in early in the morning is my pillow and my snooze button okay how many times does a sense of duty get me out of bed but then you come and you sit down and listen to what God said he said if you will open wide your mouth I will fill it I didn't say it God said it and he does satisfy the soul and he does nourish and he does bring that, that satisfaction that 
that it's talking about right here. Folks, I'm going beyond just a sense of duty. I mean, what, what, what is your attitude towards this book? Well, it's a good book. I mean, I got five or six of them around the house. It's the good book. I mean, that's great. But do you love it? Do you open your mouth and feast on it because you believe that God will satisfy your soul? You say, Aaron, isn't it just a bunch of, isn't it just a bunch of black words on white pages? Isn't it just like any other book? No, folks, this is what we call the written word, but who is it about? I'm telling you, cover to cover, ultimately, it's all about the written word. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the one who satisfies the soul. That's why Jesus was on this earth. He said this. He said, listen to these statements. He said, I am the bread of life. What did he mean by that? He meant this, I'm the one who you were made to feast on spiritually. I'm the only one who can satisfy you. What did he mean when he said, I am the good shepherd? He meant he was the one of Psalm 23 who leads us beside the still waters and restores our souls. Folks, it's him. What did he mean when he looked at the woman at the well and he said, he said, I'm the water of life. I'm the one. If you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. That's crazy. He's talking spiritually. Folks, it's Christ. That's who you find here. Folks, do duty is good. A sense of duty is right and noble. But he's talking about delight. It's kind of like this. Like, let's say, I don't know, uh, my, 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 my wife, she just actually had her birthday as well. Uh, her birthday was last Saturday, and uh, so they're just a week apart. So uh, let's say, uh, now I did take her on a date, but it wasn't quite like this, but let's say I got a date planned for my wife. Man, I got, I got babysitters planned up, you know, worked out for the kids, and, and I got a date all planned. Let's say I, I get some flowers, and I'm really excited. You know, I, I go walking up. Let's say I knock on, you know, I, I got them behind my back. I knock on the trailer door. You know, I want her to come. To, I, I'd normally just walk on in, but I want her to come to the door. So she opens up the door, and I say, hey, baby, whoosh, these are for you. And she goes, oh, Aaron, they're beautiful. Why did you? And I go, yeah, it's my duty. <laughs> what, is that not super sweet? You know, let me throw it in reverse, you know. You know, I got the flowers. I knock on the door. Hey, baby, these are for you. She goes, oh, Aaron, they're beautiful. Why did you? And I say, there's nothing I'd rather do than spend time with you. I got a date planned. Is there a difference? Folks, why do you go to church? Well, I mean, I've always gone to church. I mean, my dad went to church. My grandpa went to church. I don't know what I'd do on a Sunday morning if I didn't go to church. That's great. I'm glad you've developed a good habit. Do you come here and sit before the Word because you know it's a feast for your soul? And this is the only way we're going to be nourished through the Christ that we meet right here. Listen to what the Bible says happens to a man who doesn't listen to the counsel of this world. Instead, he feasts his soul and delights in this book. Verse number three, what a picture. It says, this man, this woman, what shall they be like? They'll be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and whatever it does will prosper. Folks, verse 3 gives us a description of what it looks like to truly be satisfied. It's a picture of a tree, a tree that's planted by rivers of water. The, the, the branches are far-reaching. The fruit, the fruit hangs down. The scorching sun of temptation and trial beat down on it. But you can't stop this tree from flourishing. Because it's nourished by rivers of water. It's nourished from the inside out. This is the picture that is given to us of a person who understands that this world is full of lies. And actually, the way that we have our soul nourished and satisfied is through feasting and delighting on the Christ that we find in this book. You know, I live in, a, I live in eastern North Carolina not too far from the coast, not quite as close to the coast as you folks live. 
Um, people think of North Carolina, they, they, they think of the beautiful mountains on the east side, they think of the beautiful coast on the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the mountains on the west side and the beautiful coast on the east side. A lot of people don't realize that right in the middle of North Carolina, there's about three hours of just flat, ugly, blah. Guess where I live? Yeah, that's where I live. Anyway, um, the, uh, it's hot. We have hot summers, dry summers, and then, man, come you know, August, September, October, hurricane season comes rolling in. You know, they uh, come smashing into the eastern seaboard. It's really something after a hot, dry summer. Um, I love to be out in the woods. I'm actually, I love, to, I love to hunt. I'm a bit of an outdoorsman. Um, but I love being out in the woods. It's really something after, after when I'm home and after a hot, dry summer and then like a hard hurricane season, you know, if a good hurricane comes and hits us hard, it's amazing some of the trees that get blown over. Tall trees, big trees, seemingly healthy trees. But you know what? They'll go over and they'll take their whole root system with them. You ever seen a whole, you know, root system that stands this high off the ground? Huge root system that just the tree goes over and the root system is exposed. You start examining the roots of a tree, you can find out a lot about a tree. A lot of trees maybe seem healthy until you look at the roots. What happens? We have hard Carolina clay once you get down deep a little bit. And sometimes just so dry and so hard that the roots can't go deep enough. And wide roots aren't as strong as deep roots. And all of a sudden you see these trees, and since it was so hard and so dry, they seem healthy, but they're just surface growth. And so they blow over and they're exposed. You know what? I meet a lot of Christians like that, and I, I want to be real careful because I, I, I don't, I don't want to be a hypocrite, but I, I think I can be like that. You know what it is? It's, it's, it's Christians who are really busy. Man, we're busy. Man, we're busy. We got to do this. And, and we're not busy in bad stuff. We're busy in good stuff. I mean, we obviously have work and life. And, but then, man, even in the midst of Christian activity, man, we got to make sure we get the kids there. We got to make sure this is going on. I mean, we got this and this and this. And if we're not careful, you know what we can be? We can be a mile wide in good, even Christian activity, a mile wide and an inch deep. Do we have depth to us? Because depth doesn't come from Christian activity. Depth comes from delighting in this book and delighting in the Christ that we find in this book. Our roots, are they deep? And you know what? Shallowness of soul, that is not relegated to youth of life. I had a man who walked up to me. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it a day in my life. I was down in Florida preaching a meeting. We went all the way to Friday. And there was this man, he had been there every single night, and I conversed with him a little bit. He was an older gentleman. On Friday night, I was standing out in the parking lot, and I was actually saying bye to some other folks. I didn't realize I was standing right, behind, right beside his vehicle, and he had actually walked up behind me and was waiting on me to finish. And I say bye to these folks. As I turned around, this man grabbed me, and he looked at me. He was an older gentleman, kind of hunched over a little bit. And he walked with a cane, and he looked at me. He said, I want you to know something. He said, I have, he said, I have studied my Bible every day this week. It's really funny because I thought he was going to say like his whole life and I was getting ready to stand in amazement of this dude. But anyway, then he said this week and I was like, amen. I, amen, brother. That's awesome. And then he said this. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, I have never done that in my entire life. Been in church his whole life. He said, I've never read my Bible every day for a week. And he looked at me and he said these words, okay? Probably easily, easily later 70s, uh, mid 80s. I don't know how old this gentleman was, but he looked at me and he said these words. He said, I am sick and tired of being shallow. And he got in his car and he drove away. My friend, I, 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 I remember just standing there. I was so taken back by... Just everything. I didn't know. I, I didn't. I didn't know he was behind me. Kind of. He kind of sp scared me. This conversation I had. I thought he was going to tell me he'd read his Bible his whole life. But then this week, and then his statement. I've never done that in my whole life. I'm tired of being shallow. I remember just watching this, and I watched him. I watched him to the end of the parking lot. I watched him pull out on the road. There was a curve. I watched him go around the curve till he was out of sight. I just watched the lights of his car till I couldn't see anymore. And I stood there and I had a moment with God in that parking lot. I said, God. I said, God, you know me. God, you know me. 
can I tell you a little something about me? I'm like, I'm easily distracted. I'm kind of hyper. I don't sit still real well. I like to go. Man, I like to go. I got a lot of things I'm passionate about, not bad stuff. I'm not into bad stuff. But let me tell you something. All of the ingredients necessary for that to be me busy, busy in good stuff, busy in Christian ministry, busy going 100 miles an hour. I love it. I said, God, please don't let that be me. I mean, I mean, I have so much respect for his resolve at his age to say I'm sick and tired of being shallow. I'm going to go do something about it. Man, do I have respect for his resolve. At the same time, I'm like, God, please keep me in your word. You keep me on my knees. You keep me. Don't let me be satisfied with the stuff of this world. You keep me coming to you to have my soul satisfied. I want you to look at verse number four. Look at this picture. It's overwhelming, the difference, the contrast Look at what he just got through talking about a tree, okay? Folks, verse 3 is talking about a tree that I'm telling you can handle uh, the blast of a hurricane. It's unmovable because it's so strong and its roots are so deep. But look at verse number 4. It's talking about a man who says, I don't need God. It's a man who says, I don't need his word. Once again, that word wicked, it's the same word we find in verse number 1. It's a person who, who lives life without God, a man who, uh, or a woman who says, I don't need God. Look at what it says, verse number four. The wicked are not so. Now, what does that mean, they're not so? They're not like the tree that can handle a hurricane. Listen to the contrast. The person who says, I don't need God. I don't need to spend time with him. I don't need to delight in his word. I don't need to feast my soul on Jesus Christ. The things of the world satisfy me just fine. Listen to the contrast. They are not, it says, like a tree that can be planted by the rivers of water that can handle a hurricane. Listen to this. But instead, verse 4, they are like the chaff that the wind drives away. What's the chaff? They would take the grain, they would take the wheat, they would take it down to the threshing floor, and they would beat it on the threshing floor. The grains of wheat were heavy, so they would fall and they would gather the wheat together. But the chaff was the feather-like fluffy packing that was inside of each grain of wheat. It protected the wheat. It just, it was like a feather. And what it would do is it would float in the air. The grain of wheat would fall to the threshing floor. The chaff would just float in the air. And the wind, just a whisper of a wind, could blow it away. Listen to the contrast. A person who says, I don't need God, is like the featherweight chaff that the wind blows away. Where a person who lives life saying, I need him, I'm going to open my mouth and let him fill me, is like a tree that can handle a hurricane. Sir, what do you want to be? Ma'am, what do you want to be? What, what, what do you think your kids need for you to be? What do you think your wife needs for you to be? Your husband needs for you to be? The people in your life. Folks, do I, I want to be like this tree. My roots are deep because I'm satisfied and I'm nourished by God and His Word. Folks, this is what's laid before us. This is what's laid before us. And I want you to look, look at those last two verses. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You know what, maybe the reason why God has brought you here today is you, you, you've, you've never known the satisfaction that God has planned for his people. And maybe you've never seen your need of Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never seen your need of, 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 of Jesus Christ. You know, I mentioned just a few moments ago um, in John chapter number 4, the woman at the well, 
so unique. John chapter 3, you have this, you have this religious leader. His name was Nicodemus. He thought he was really, really good. Chapter number 4, you have this lady. She had been, Jesus comes to her and says, where's your husband? She said, well, I don't have a husband. He's, Jesus knows her just like he knows you. It even says right here, God knows the way of the wicked. God knew this lady. He said, you tell me the truth um, in that you don't have a husband right now. You've actually had four, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. This woman was searching in relationships is where she thought she was going to be satisfied. Jesus looks at her in the chapter before he looked at Nicodemus, and you know what his answer to both of them was? Religious eliteness will not satisfy your soul, and looking for love and relationships will not satisfy your soul. Jesus was saying to both of them, I'm the only one who can satisfy your soul. I don't know who, you all, who all of you folks are today. I know some of you from the last time I was here, some I've met this morning. Maybe the reason God brought you here is because you have lived a life of searching, 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 and you have come up empty and empty, empty. My friend, would you turn to Christ? Would you turn to Christ? He's the only one who can satisfy your soul. Would you turn to Christ? If you don't have a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, would you please let us help you? I'm telling you, He died, he died on a cross, not for His sins. He died on a cross for our sins so that we could be rescued, so that we could be saved, so that we could be brought into a right relationship with the Father. It is only through Jesus Christ. If you are here without Christ, would you please let us help you? Pastor Jason would love to help you. I would love to help you. In just a few moments, we are going to have a chance to respond um, for the most part today I was preaching from Psalm 1 to those who are believers what is your attitude towards the word what are you looking to to satisfy your soul I would love for us just to pray and to really come to God and say God would you satisfy me God would you do a work in me I'm coming to you with my mouth with my mouth open would you fill it God would you help me to not just live this duty-driven Christianity. God, don't let me just be feasting on the things of the world. I'm so spiritually hungry. God, don't let me be shallow. God, fill me. Teach me. Help me to delight in your word. I would love just to have a time. I want to have my wife come to the piano. She's going to come down and play just through one verse. And just through this one verse, just with our heads bowed, I, would, I think it would be great for you just to pray. Talk to God. Ask God to help you. Ask God to, to do a work in your heart when it comes to your attitude towards the Word. Can we just come to Him? At the same time, if you're here without Christ, you don't have a relationship with Christ, would you let us help you? You could step to the back. You could step to the front. You could meet with us after the service. We would love to talk to you. Would you let us help you, show you, introduce you to a man named Jesus Christ who will change your life, change your eternity? Let's bow our heads. Can we just come to God today?